Morning all. I had an interesting game last night. It was Barnet against uh, against uh, St Albans Chess Club away. Uh, we were a bit late getting there, about 15 minutes, but lucky I think they started the clocks a little bit late. Uh, so they're a great uh, bunch of players at St Albans Chess Club. It's one of the largest uh, clubs in in Hertfordshire. Unfortunately for St Albans 1, they're, they're on the way to relegation this season. It's been so strong, Division 1, uh, with teams like Hartford and Watford, they're, they're leading. Um, I myself had an, an unfortunate blunder uh, just the night before this game, hence uh, the video you see on the channel about uh, loose pieces, it involved loose pieces, and I thought I'd go over a few examples, and I found that very interesting Cecil Purdy quote. So that kind of idea was drifting through my mind, if I could use that in this game, uh, you know, exploiting loose pieces, looking out for double attacks, myself. Um, overall, I've been doing quite well in the Hearts League. Uh, we've only lost one loss, uh, so up to this game and, and three wins. And I won't tell you the result of this game, we're just going to go through it. So I was playing white against uh, Jeff Hollis, who I played before, and there's a draw annotated on the channel before. I mean, I refer to him as a wily fox. He didn't give me any exploitable weaknesses in that game. Here we were playing to a finish. Uh, he had set the time control. So play to a finish, no adjudication or adjournment. So G6, I play C4. Um, I'm thinking, you know, I want to adopt this this uh, counterplay removal uh, strategy, and I thought I'd revisit the wet lettuce system, uh, partly because actually it had been used a lot uh, recently uh, by GMs like Carlson and Aronian, this kind of wet lettuce system, so that we'll see it in action. Bishop g7, knight c3, c5, symmetrical English at the moment, g3, knight c6. So the question is, can I actually get an advantage from this sort of uh, symmetrical position? Well, I'm following a standard plan after bishop g2, d6, and thankfully he's the one which creates an exciting pawn structure here with e5, which is a system um, a, a lot of strong players use to clamp down on d4. It's got some side effects on the light squares, and there's a logical plan available for white here, well, two twofold, um, two logical plans. One is to try and play for a3 and b4 to try and undermine there. The other is to try and uh, do some knight manoeuvring around d5. I tried to play both plans, a3. After knight g e7, here immediately b4, got to be careful about e4s in this diagonal. So preparation with rook b1 to get out of the way of the bishop. A5, it's all logical stuff. Black's clamping down on white playing B4. And the knight is also doing that as well. Knight E1. After castles, I was a bit surprised now after knight C2. This next move, knight D4. I was expecting more of a liberation in the centre, an idea to liberate the centre. Uh, maybe bishop E6. Or even uh, rook rook B8. Or bishop E6. I think that's that's theory. My, my good friend Alex is um, mentioning some theory here. Uh, in this position, but he actually played knight d4. I mean, after the game, <laughs> knight d4. Okay, so the problem, well, kind of weakness of the last move. It does does mean that b4 is actually playable now. I'm not losing a piece or anything. Bishop g4 is not that painful. I've got e2 covered, so I thought I could get away with playing b4. But there was a tactical note I had made in this position uh, that um, after b4. That uh, if he goes like this to take, and then uh, play queen a5 pseudo aggressive, there is actually a good move here. I wonder if you can spot it. Uh, five seconds. There's, I think there's rook a4, and that's what I'm saying. I think rook a4, and um, it's embarrassing that rook. So black can't easily create uh, too much activity on the a file. He took did take on b4 and played knight e c6, and I thought I'm getting a a reasonable advantage here potentially. First of all, uh, after BC, I've got some coordination. I've got the bishop on coordinating on B7. The rook here is is just firing on a, a blank line with no target. So I've got a target. Bishop seems comfortable. Furthermore, D5 is a bit of a weakness. Whilst the knight on D4, I could eventually kick after this. I can kick this knight with E3, and that's my next plan. I want to put a knight on D5. And kick my opponent. So knight e3, and a rather curious move now. Rook a7 is played, which um, potentially is going to give me a nice knight b5 tempo gainer once I evict this pesky knight here. 
knight e d5 and another move now which I thought hmm interesting f5 because potentially it's blocking in the bishop um, after e3 knight e6 black I did notice thankfully that um, if I play a bit too casually I'm going to give black lots of play and a ferocious attack so I play the casual move bishop b2 then f4 and I'm not really succeeding in my counterplay removal strategy black's going to have lots of play maybe knight g5 later threatening f3 h3 is going to be under fire but there's a move which I think is very important to cut all this out uh, just simply f4 and it tries to like hem in this bishop as well so I'm hopefully cutting out most of the uh, ferocious counterplay with this move he plays rook e8 and after bishop b2 I'm also now looking forward to um, building up uh, my position with later knight b5 and maybe even exchanging off this and this happens sooner than, sooner than I anticipated because black now plays e4 so I play knight b5 attacking the rook and now I've got some dark square weaknesses after bishop takes g7 okay um, if he plays knight takes g7 there might be knight c7 forking both rooks so king takes g7 and now a very comfortable move play d3 I'm trying to liberate this bishop make it id5 again I'm trying to put my queen on this diagonal as well at some point after ed queen d3 already this this looks a bit of a menace on these dark squares with this huge knight on d5 I, was, I really loved my position here and actually I've got to say as as general uh, strategies for long games there's one aspect psychological purely psychological of the idea of trying to reduce opponents counterplay and what I find psychological it has a very calming influence that essentially you're trying to take away uh, the worries I if you can take away the opponents counterplay, what are you going to be worried about and uh, the opponent here did try and cr set some worries for me he's trying to sacrifice a pawn now with his next move knight b4 so this is another a pattern which I visited in a, a previous video materialism versus counterplay removal do I try and just simply win this pawn now after queen c3 check he's given me a free pawn he's putting his king in an awkward place but where else is the king going to go f7 doesn't look look too healthy you know this diagonal is going to be dangerous probably later knight d6 might be dangerous later or even g4 and f5 it's, it's a sitting target you can imagine peeling up this uh, diagonal as well so he actually chose king h6 but there's this question here that you know I'm trying to be calm about the position try and get rid of the worries but taking a pawn would increase the, the worries in the position I just thought for example if we have a look at this for example queen b6 you know he's on e3 then knight c5 I've got a target on c4 I've got a target on e e3 his pieces come to life a bit he's got access to a2 even more worrying can I get rid of all the worries without winning material after all material quality time how do I do this in this position and I'm not sure even this is a technically good move uh, though what I did come up with I, I thought it was an interesting idea and I played g4 now clearly there's a, there's a horrible threat of g5 and if the king really wants to venture up it's going to get mated surely so he takes this pawn and I had ruled out early, before playing this f5 because I thought I'm going to get in big trouble if I play f5 even though it promises rook f6 there's knight d4 here and he's threatening knight e2 check and this could really backfire this sort of thing so actually my intention here was actually to play e4 so I'm still reserving f5 but I'll still be blunting this bishop I've got control of d4 I'm not too worried about that um, and okay in this position maybe he panics a bit that maybe okay it looks as though it might be a difficult position for black to play given f5 is coming up I'm not sure this was the greatest idea knight takes d5 and then giving the pawn back with knight d4 because what I've achieved okay is I, I'm really taking this pawn now he was threatening knight e2 and I want to take my pawn back so we're equal on pawns again but he's got double pawns his king's slightly out of place and um, I've got this center which might be quite good fun 
Uh, you can imagine this target on b7 emerging. He plays rook f8, and I, I suddenly think, hold on a sec, do I want to allow this? This rook's going to make a good good entry into position on f4. This looks familiar, this structure. I've had this structure recently, and I didn't play e5 because I was worried about these light square blockades. And that's a bit of experience coming in. Do I really want to worry about the light square blockades, or is the inertia of this central pawn mass more important than the f5 blockade? And one thing you know about blockades is that if you allow blockades, there's the fun of unblocking them later. So I did play e5 to rule out rook f6, and not too bothered about bishop f5 at the moment. Um, he sets a little tactical trap, actually, rook f7. If I play e6, then he just takes you know the pin. Got to be careful. I play d6 here, and I thought this is quite a beautiful position again. I'm doing well here. Plays rook a2. And now this idea that both of these pieces are loose and a double attack comes into mind. My immediate thought, which is was probably a, a rubbish uh, variation I had analysed, not not quite correct, is if bishop d5, I thought he had this tactical trick, queen h4, and okay, he's threatening mate now, and if I take this, I thought g3, and this is really nothing. I don't know why I ruled this out, but it seems to just win a rook in clear daylight and just protect h2. For some reason, I was wondering about queen d5, which is less accurate by far. <laughs> just winning the exchange. I know, it's it's terrible, but this is what I played. Uh, and he, it offers him the opportunity at least to uh, get a bishop. But I thought it's still, you know, the exchange up and pretty menacing with the pawns. Um, so I, for some reason, um, yeah. But a bit of a terrible miscalculation there, but let's move on. Bishop f5, I'm still the exchange up. Rook b e1. And I'm, I've still got a really quite menacing position with these pawns anyway. Bishop d3, rook f2. And it has to be said, he's also in severe time pressure by this stage. Queen b6. And I take on g4. Queen b4 attacking the rook. I just retreat my queen here. I think this is actually a good move now. <laughs> Uh, because the queen's actually not only attacking the bishop, it's also supporting potentially d7. Bishop f5, and I just start driving his pieces back. e6, rook f8, e7, rook e8. And now the queen, you know, if I play d7, then bishop d7, you know, he's going to try and decoy my queen away from e1, but I just play queen d2 here. And then he plays queen b6, and the final move, d7. Okay, so... Okay, I thought I'd show you that game. I hope you got something out of it. Let's, I mean, we could do an engine check um, just briefly. Uh, it seems in this game, you know, the wet lettuce system showed some teeth finally. So I think I think there's definitely an attitude behind playing in such a way. You've got to try and collect, accumulate positional advantages and reduce counterplay. And then maybe the system can work out for you. So let's have a look. Well, that's what I think. I think... If if the top you know grandmasters are using it sometimes, I think there's something in it. It's it's a very very standard plan. It's like a Sicilian uh, sort of dragon in reverse, where you're trying to you're trying to emphasise this bishop, this rook, and the d5 square. So strategically, it's quite a neat system. But sometimes I just think you know, if Black plays um, theoretically with this d5, sometimes Black's approaching quality, unfortunately. But here, this was quite nice that um, I managed to get a significant grip on d5 and uh, some significant pressure along this diagonal. Uh, so this bishop on c8 is not having the best of times at the moment. And with this grip on d5 coming up and f5 played, this was very nice to be able to lock down this bishop. So I think this is an important aspect. You don't want to be hacked up on the king side. And positionally, you know, it's targeting the c8 bishop. Okay, I think the engine likes white here. Rook e8, bishop b2. e4, the engine really likes white now after knight b5 coming up soon. Uh, knight b5 or d3, it likes. Likes taking. It likes d3 here. It likes a lot of my moves here. 
Queen d3. White's got nearly plus two, and it's equal on material. But this is quite a dominating position. It's it's unclear how Black uh, proceeds without trying to play actively with a pawn sack. If you know, if he plays, let's say Rook f8. Let's say Rook f d1. King g8. Okay, there's some tactical possibilities that now emerge apparently, like knight d6 because we got that knight f6 discovered check, and this this is uncomfortable for Black. Uh, so this sort of position, I'm actually on b7 as well. It looks as though this this starts to get very uncomfortable in any case. So he tried to play actively, to his credit. So check. Now, if I do take this pawn, the engine actually doesn't like taking the pawn. It prefers rook f d1. And for some reason, I'd rejected rook f d1. Um, I thought maybe it just takes a knight c7. Uh, but there's something the engine sees here, which m maybe I didn't. I think it might be critical to, well, preserving the knight with knight a3 is interesting. But also bishop f1. Why, why would this be so strong? I mean, this d pawn does look like a, a menace. Uh, so let's see. Well, c5 is, is also a problem. Okay, and if he dared go into that horrible pin, well, again, queen c5. And it's pretty horrible. Uh, this, this looks like nasty stuff. He's going to drop a piece here. Okay, so I guess that's what I should have played if the engine says so. Rook fd1, but I played g4, which I thought was interesting, and it significantly blows apparently a lot of my technical advantage that I had. Um, David Hotham after the game was recommending well, as an idea e4. This might actually be stronger. With the idea of g4 now, he, he had the idea of g4, and this looks dangerous as well. So let's have a look at this. She's stronger here as g5. <coughs> Pardon me. And um, this this looks as I'm winning, winning a piece. Uh, the king doesn't look healthy on h5. <laughs> Queen g7 threatening mate. Um, this doesn't look good. So maybe that's that's even stronger than that. That looks to be an even stronger continuation. Than one I played here. If Black tries to defend with G5, which was what I mentioned to David Hotton after the game. Okay, there's various like Rook BD1. And if Black ever took, you might ask. Taking check. Oh, the Queen's on praise anyway. <laughs> this, is, this is Knight takes B4 is a menacing threat here. So th this looks good as well. This this idea of just e4, as well as g4. Uh, so the, does the actual, actual engine find either? No, it still prefers its rook fd1. Um, maybe it's third choice e4, fourth choice somewhere, somewhere e4, like third choice or fourth. Okay, so I played g4, the most inferior. So fg, and now e4, and apparently it's just about equal now. So I have technically blown things here but it looked quite fun to play um, this position rook f8 let's say queen g3 I think I've still got an advantage but it's not as big as before I think it's easier to play though that's that's the common uh, thing I'd, I'd just like to, to say when, when it comes to engine analysis I thought this was easier to play and he goes wrong you know maybe because it's easier to play this this looks wrong and especially knight d4 now, so he's, he's handing me back a big advantage from an engine point of view. This 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 is actually a meaningful advantage again, technically. Uh, this center, these pawns coming forward, and uh, the engine likes those two natural moves. Getting this pawn formation, even though it's blockadable, it's the fun of unblockading and the potential liberation eventually when the blockades are lifted. And now here's here's a howler move, rook a2. So bishop d5 much stronger than queen d5. Uh, let's just check that out. So bishop d5, there's there's no tactical stuff going on here, or is there? G3 immediately. It's not a problem. It's not a problem. It's king h1 here. 
Okay, so this this is uh, absolutely no good. You just take care. G three is not a problem. Just root B two. Okay, so okay, okay. Queen D five, but still, th this is this is winning. Winners win. So it's the exchange up with a dominating pawn center. It's plus three still. Um, and okay, it it should be quite easy to convert this. Uh, Queen d1 does help him. It's actually a strong move, even from an engine point of view, for e6. So the blockade has been lifted. The pawns start to crash through. Queen d2, another strong move, just to get rid of that hold on e1 that the queen has. And then now d7 is freer without any decoy deflection. So um, yeah, I hope you got something from it. Um, I'm enjoying the Hearts League. It's my favourite league at the moment, even though I've, I've lost one just prior to this game. I've won four in that league. I've got an over 210 performance now. My worst league is Middlesex, where I've lost three. I've drawn one. North Circular, I've won one, drawn one. So overall, I'm just doing the same rating wise, which is a shame. I had some silly losses in the Middlesex League, but yeah, it's an up and down um, thing. But what made me quite uh, pleased is when I say psychologically this idea of playing at least calmly without too many worries if you're trying to remove counterplay there's a psychological benefit there uh, you know about reducing concerns uh, reducing the prob probability of losing really if you're reducing counterplay so I thought this was this was quite good even though there's yeah, some technical flaws flaws in it clearly but um okay Comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.